Yesterday, uh, my, uh, my son and I see each other in passing in the kitchen while he's going to work, uh, and I'm getting ready to come here. <clears throat> and uh, he surprised me by asking me, hey, what are you giving up for Lent? And I said, artichokes. <laughs> and he said, you don't eat artichokes. I said, I know, I want to be sure I can do it. Now that was a tough decision for me because I actually started liking Brussels sprouts. So there are some things you can't say. He said, what did you really give up? And I said, swearing. And he said, you don't swear. And I said, see how good I'm doing? <laughs> Lent is a time when we encourage one another to reset our priorities. And as it says in our book of worship, it's a time for us to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. <laughs> Keep that in mind as we go along. Struggling against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. Let is a time when we encourage one another to be on that road. And even Pope Francis said about Lent, I don't want you to give something up. I want you to start something. I want you to choose something during Lent that will help to create the beloved community that the Bible talks about. So this Lent, maybe don't think about stopping something. Think about starting something. Now our story today is a story from the Gospel of Mark, the shortest account that we have of the temptation of Jesus. And it was a common belief in the ancient world that when a person entered on a path to become a holy person, that they would enter through a period of testing, a period of struggle when they could prove that they were ready for the mission that God had with them in the world. And the main point of the temptation of Jesus is that Jesus is being tempted to give up the mission that he knows that God is calling him to be about in the world. And for all of us, that's the main temptation. Our greatest temptation in Lent is not about depriving ourselves of chocolate or broccoli. We are tempted to give up on our vision of the way the world that God intends it to be. And the Spirit drives us out to struggle against the forces of injustice, prejudice, and inequality, because these are the things that lead us away from the love of neighbor. Now we all know that we're living in scary and confusing times in history, a time when the world has become very small, where communication is very easy, where information is around the world in a moment, where we can't hide anything. And some people can hide everything. And the very real temptation that we have is to give up on Jesus' vision for what the world ought to be. And to do nothing. And to accept things the way they are. And we forget who God called us to be. So I want to encourage you today not to think about condemnation, but think about affirmation. And I want you to leave today being willing to affirm everyone that you can. To tell them not to give in to their fears. Because today, people in the world fear things. They're afraid. And people believe the worst. And we've lost that fundamental trust in God and other people. So I want to encourage you this morning, no matter how difficult the struggle is, don't give up on Jesus' dream. So we have to ask ourselves the question as Jesus is out in the wilderness with Satan. What does the devil say to you in the wilderness? Well, in Scripture, the devil says to Jesus things like, nobody cares for you. Did you ever have that devil in your life? That little voice inside your head that said, you're all alone. Nobody cares for you. You have to make it on your own. Satan questions Jesus' worth. 
his dignity, his morality, and his intentions. Satan said to Jesus, in quotes, about his ability, you know, you're not really that special, so you ought to give up right now. About bribery, if you quit working for people on the bottom, there will be more for you. And threats. Not even God will be able to protect you if he has too much suspicion. Think about how some of those same things bring through our world today. You know, religion has always been about the thing called equanimity. And it influenced people one day, 200 some years ago, to include the phrase, we believe that all people are created equal. We live in a world where that is challenged daily. And we have organizations with names like Black Lives Matter, Muslim Lives Matter, Police Lives Matter. Our religion causes us to have eyes to see and ears to hear, to work wherever we can for equanimity and equality. I learned a lot from the uh, from uh, the, some of the men at uh, Tent City. I'm not sure what's going to become of that or those folks, but we need to watch over them in transitions. But one of them uh, continued to make a point to me about articles in the newspaper. And uh, if there was a crime or something happened in the, in the community, uh, the newspaper would often say a homeless man committed this crime. A homeless man was found here and such. And he said that they shouldn't say that because that casts a negative light on that person. They ought to just say a man did this. Because when you say a homeless man, that automatically casts him in a different light and people judge him differently if he's homeless. And so Jesus, before he went out on his ministry, he had affirmation. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And someone needs to give homeless people affirmation. You are God's beloved child. And we're well pleased that you're here today. Often, the news will try to help events by listing the person's nationality or their race or their religion, or their social status, whether it's an event or a crime, it's always this type of person shot this type of person. I think we ought to humanize it. I think we ought to say, like, someone's son shot someone else's son. And to make it a real situation, to humanize it. Or maybe even one of our own, a human being, shot another human being. To humanize our world and to take away its prejudice. Justice means something very different if you are poor from people who have financial ability to defend themselves. And there are all these accusatory voices howling in the wilderness. And by God, if you're on Facebook, you'll hear all of them. <laughs> if you read comments to, to uh, articles in the Daily Record, you'll hear all those accusatory voices howling in the wilderness. And we cannot allow ourselves to internalize those things or to allow those accusers in the wilderness to stop us from our mission to create a world that God wants to see. We have to remember that there's a dynamic in bullies. And bullies are not always physical, but sometimes they are also verbal bullies. And to re realize that in life, everyone needs allies. 
Everyone needs people who will speak an affirmative word to them. And that's why the work of our church is about blessing and affirming all people. And recently we've been talking about that in the ONA process, the open and affirming. To include everyone. To affirm everyone. Regardless of the circumstances of their life. And like Jesus, we have to say to those negative voices, you don't have power over me. I won't allow you to control me anymore to stop me from doing the things that I need to do. John Steinbeck has a kind of an interesting phrase. He said, man is the only kind of varmint that sets his own trap, baits it, and then steps in it. Now the gospel was good news in Jesus' day. It was good news because they had a divided world. And we always have to ask ourselves the question, how is what we are doing good news for the world? Some sectors of our economy live by the ethic that if someone is weaker than you or less powerful than you, then you have the right to take advantage of them. And that's not covenant. It's not ethical, even though sometimes it might be legal. We have to make that distinction. There are many things that are legal, but they certainly aren't ethical. And it's certainly not loving your neighbor. Loving our neighbor implies affirming our neighbor. Not taking them to the cleaners. Not taking advantage of their misfortune or their place in life. There are so many good movements that are going on in the world today. And some of you may have seen the FBI director came from Yonkers, New York, and he recently came out with a statement about crime. In Yonkers, New York, they have a policy called stop and frisk. That means you stop anybody and frisk it. People in the community were beginning to rebel against that, become hostile about it. And so the police captain, John Mueller, and a community member, Hector Santiago, got together. And they created a program, as reported by Joel Rose on NPR, called Stop and Shake. The police department thought it was a good idea. Stop and Shake. So if you're a community member, and you see a policeman on the street, you walk up to the policeman, you extend your hand, you shake hands with the policeman, and you say, hi, how are you doing? My name is, are you having a good day? And then you begin a conversation, a conversation that humanizes the other person, a legitimate conversation. Today I'm going to save you a lot of money because I have four pieces of advice by Daniel Amon, who is on TED Talks and he's written many books on changing your brain and the way your brain works. And I'm gonna give you the four keys that he has about your brain, since it also has to do with the primary place where we feel tempted not to do anything. First of all, his great advice, and I think this is wonderful, he says, don't believe the first thought you have. Okay? Don't believe the first thought you have. Imagine what habit could be playing in your life <coughs> if you spoke the first thought you had in a situation. Imagine what would happen to us if we didn't have that ability to reflect and to be patient and to wait for a good thing to come. Many of us jump and say things without reflecting. So first of all, this is his great wisdom. Don't believe the first thought you have. And the second is kind of like it. It's kind of like the words that Satan spoke to Jesus in the wilderness. Number two, you have to realize how powerful your thoughts and your beliefs are. Because they will control every aspect of your life. They can either make your brain great, or can run you to anxiety and confusion. 
know that your thoughts are powerful. And third, know that all of us have an incomplete thoughts. Be aware that you don't know everything. Be aware that no matter what conclusion you come to, that there's always something more. There's always more that you have to add to the piece of the puzzle and to include everything. And fourth, now people pay a lot of money for this, okay? They go to seminars, they listen to Daniel Allman, they get this advice. Fourth is be intentional about having specific intentions in your mind. Decide what you want to do and be in life. Think about that. There's so many people that don't even practice Lent. That they don't know what they want from life. They have no intention to live out of. And so therefore they live in that moment. So that's what Jesus was doing in the temptation. He was choosing his path and making a determination to stay on it. And too often in our world today, we have let the voices of anxiety and fear prevail in our heads. And we've allowed them to keep us quiet. They've bribed us, they've threatened us, they've tried to discourage us, and Lent is about facing those Life is about claiming our intentions. And I intend to fight the good fight for grace and understanding as long as I can pray. Remember the power of that saying, I intend good things for you. Now I encourage you this next week to say to someone, I hope good things for you. Try it. People need to hear that. Plenty of people you come across are going to need to hear that this week. So let's live a life of affirmation instead of condemnation. In the Greek, it says literally, the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Willem Dafoe played Jesus in the last temptation of Christ. And in that scene, when he was going out to be tempted, he was uh, being pushed by invisible hands and he was falling down in the sand and he'd get up and he'd run some more. The Spirit drove Jesus out of the wilderness. What was it that drove Jesus? It was the same thing that we see today. Dissatisfactions of war, disharmony of relationships, the human preoccupation with greed and pride and self-interest, self-aggrandizement, and this is what Jesus came to save us from. The Spirit drove Jesus. The Spirit drove me to seminary and ministry and continue prophetic witness in the community. Will you allow the Spirit to drive you out, to join the struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor? If anybody asks you what was the first sermon of Jesus, it's right here. And he said, the time is now. Heaven has come near to you. Repent and believe the good news. For those of you who start out the one minute thing, the one minute starting right now. How is what we are doing good news for the world? Our greatest temptation this land is not about depriving ourselves of chocolate or broccoli. We are being tempted to give up on God's mission in the world. And the Spirit drives us out to struggle against the forces of injustice, prejudice, and inequality. Because these things leads us away from the love of neighbor. And we are living in a scary and a confusing moment in history. And our very real temptation in this moment is to give up on Jesus' vision for the world. Accept things the way they are. And we forget that God calls us to be. So go out into the world and affirm everyone you can. And tell them not to be afraid. The 
world is afraid. People believe the worst. We've lost fundamental trust in God and other people. And I want to encourage you this morning, no matter how difficult your struggle may be, whatever happens, don't give up 